This is the 24th video in our series devoted to abstract algebra. And in fact, this is the last video of the series, apart from the example video, which will come after this. And what we've covered here is essentially one path towards a standard undergraduate course in abstract algebra, in the US at least. And so I think there are two maybe standard first courses in abstract algebra. One is the one that we've done, which focused on groups and rings, but doesn't go super deeply into both. Definitely hits all of the isomorphism theorems and also some other high points. Another way of doing a first course in abstract algebra is to only focus on groups and go a bit further. Like maybe you look at group actions and you end with the CeeLo theorems. Okay, so I know some of you may be disappointed that we didn't hit some of those more advanced topics, but don't worry. From here, what I'm going to do is fill in some of the missed topics with mini-series. I think I'm going to do a mini-series on CeeLo theory, and then probably like not so much a mini-series, but a longer series on rings and modules. And then perhaps like something on Galois theory in the future as well. So I think we want to look at this as something that will develop over time and eventually this YouTube channel will have like essentially every course that you can think of on it. And if you want to help that happen, think about joining the Patreon. Okay, so anyway, let's get into the material of this last video. I want to recall a couple of things. I want to recall that if F is a field, then we know some things about the polynomial ring F adjoin X. First of all, it's a principal ideal domain or a PID. That means every ideal is principal. It has the division algorithm. And with the division algorithm, we were also able to construct greatest common divisors and write those greatest common divisors as combinations of the original functions or the original polynomials, I should say. It also has the notion of an irreducible polynomial. That was a polynomial that was not factorable into polynomials of smaller degree. And then I'd like to also recall this pretty important result from uh, several videos ago that said M is a maximal ideal of R if and only if R mod M is a field. And this is gonna be really important for what we'll do today. So let's look at our big result for the day and then at everything after this big result is really just like building things to use this big result. It says the principal ideal generated by the polynomial P of X is maximal if and only if P of X is an irreducible polynomial. I should point out that we're within F adjoin X throughout this video. Now, why is this important? Well, checking if an ideal is maximal is pretty tricky, but checking that a polynomial is irreducible is generally something that's more elementary. But if we get an irreducible polynomial, then we get a maximal ideal, then forming the quotient, we get a brand new field. And this is a really great way of constructing new fields out of old fields. Okay, so this is an if and only if statement. Let's start with the forward direction. So let's suppose that the principal ideal generated by P of X is maximal. And notice, like I mentioned before, that implies that F adjoin X mod P of X is a field. But now the interesting that, thing that we're gonna do right now is use the fact that every field is an integral domain. So this implies that this quotient, F adjoin X mod, the principal ideal is an integral domain. Okay, so that's good. Now we'll go back and look at our polynomial. So now let's factor our polynomial and show that that factorization is trivial. In other words, it doesn't actually factor into polynomials of smaller degree. So let's have P of X equals F of X times G of X. And let's notice from this setup, that implies that the degree of F of X and the degree of G of X are both less than or equal to the degree of P of X. Of course, we want to show that one of them is equal to the degree of P of X and the other one is equal to zero. Not the zero polynomial, a constant polynomial which has 
degree zero. But if we had a non-trivial factorization, then we would have a strict inequality there. But since we're aiming for irreducibility here, we want a trivial factorization. Okay, so now since this is an integral domain, we know that P of X is a prime ideal. So that's a result that we had from a few videos ago as well. So, like I said, f adjoin x mod p of x is an integral domain. That means the ideal that we're quotienting by is a prime ideal. And now let's notice that p of x is most definitely in the ideal generated by p of x. That's super trivial. Then that implies that the product f of x times g of x is in the ideal generated by p of x. That's because p of x is f of x times g of x. But since we have a prime ideal, anytime you've got a product of two things inside of the ideal, that means that one of them is inside of the ideal. So that means f of x is inside of this ideal or g of x is inside of this ideal. And notice the, the naming of these doesn't really matter, so we might as well assume one of them is in the ideal. So without loss of generality, let's assume that f of x is inside of the ideal. Okay, nice. But what does that mean? So being inside the ideal means you are a multiple of p of x. So that means that f of x is in fact equal to a of x times p of x. But now looking at this, this tells us that the degree of f of x is bigger than or equal to the degree of p of x, just based on how these degree arithmetic rules work. Okay, but now let's take this inequality right here and this inequality right here, and notice that we've exactly shown that the two degrees are the same. So we have the degree of f of x is equal to the degree of p of x. Okay, so let's reiterate what we have. We have p of x is equal to f of x times g of x. The degree of p is the same thing as the degree of f. That means that the degree of g must be zero. So the degree of g of x equals zero, but that means that g of x is equal to something that I'll call alpha just in the field. But what does that mean? That means that the only possible factorization of our polynomial was a factorization that included a constant. But that's exactly the condition we need for our polynomial to be, well, essentially not factorable except for a trivial factorization. In other words, for our polynomial to be irreducible. So that's what we have. So that finishes off this first direction. Now let's move on to the second. Okay, so now for the reverse direction. So let's suppose that P of X, which let's recall is an F adjoint X is irreducible. So it's an irreducible polynomial. Also, let's take an ideal and this ideal is inside of f of x such that, well, it's between the ideal generated by p of x and the whole ring. But that's exactly the setup for her showing something as a maximal ideal. Remember a maximal ideal is one that doesn't have anything between it and the whole ring. Okay, so let's write that down. We have P of X is inside of I, which is in turn inside of F of X. Well, of course, everything is living inside of F of X. Okay, so next we know that F adjoin X is a PID. So let's use that. So because f adjoin x is a p id, i equals a principal ideal generated by f of x for some polynomial f of x in our polynomial ring. Remember, that's what it means to be a p id. Every ideal is generated by a single element. Okay, nice. So putting that together, we have the following like chain of ideals. We have the ideal generated by p of x is contained within the ideal generated by f of x, which is obviously contained in our ground ring, this like f adjoin x, or our parent ring, if you will. Okay, 
So let's put a box around that. That's what we have so far. But notice if this ideal, the one generated by P of X, is a subset of the one generated by F of X, that tells us that P of X as a polynomial must be inside of that ideal, which in turn tells us that P of X is a multiple of F of X. Again, that's what it means to be in a principal ideal. But what do we have here? Now we have a factorization of P of X. But the only possible factorization of P of X will include a degree zero polynomial. So that implies that the degree of F of X equals zero or the degree of G of X equals zero. In other words, F of X equals a non-zero constant. I'll write that as being inside of F times. That's all of the non-zero elements or g of x is equal to a non-zero constant. I'll again write that the same way as in f times. That is the set of non-zero elements. Okay, so let's do these one case at a time. Let's maybe call this one case one, and then we'll call this one case two, and let's actually just take them right down the middle like this. So if the degree of f is zero, like we said before, f of x is just a constant polynomial, but a constant polynomial is a unit. So notice viewing alpha inside of f adjoin x, it is a unit inside of f adjoin x. Well, that's because it's a unit in the ground ring and that makes it a unit in the polynomial ring. We proved something like that before. Okay, but that tells us that the ideal generated by f of x is the same thing as the ideal generated by alpha, but anytime you have an ideal generated by a unit, you get everything. So this is in fact just the whole ring, the whole polynomial ring. Oh, but that's one scenario that we wanted. Let's recall that something's a maximal ideal. If you try to fit something in between, it's either everything or what we started with. So this is a good scenario to come up with. Now let's look at the other one. That says the degree of g of x equals zero, which means g of x equals beta. But that means that we can write f of x as beta inverse times p of x, which itself is inside of the ideal generated by p of x. But if f of x is inside of the ideal generated by p of x, that means the ideal generated by f of x is a subset of the ideal generated by p of x. But now starting with the assumption here, or maybe here better, that the ideal generated by P is a subset of the ideal generated by F, and then in this scenario we have the opposite containment, that tells us that these two are equal. So in other words, the ideal generated by F is the same thing as the ideal generated by P. And that's the other scenario that we wanted to get at. So recall, we try to put an ideal between a maximal ideal and the ring, it's either the whole ring or it's the maximal ideal, and that's what we came up with here. So these two things together show us that the ideal generated by P of X is in fact maximal. Okay, great. Now let's see where this leads us. Okay, so the very important takeaway of the result that we've just shown is that if you've got a field F, and you take the polynomial ring f adjoin x and you mod by an ideal generated by an irreducible polynomial, you get a field. And I think a great way to think about this as, is as a construction device for new fields. And that logically leads us to the question, how do we find irreducible polynomials? Because those are a key ingredient in the construction of these new fields. Well, finding them over ZP adjoin X is a bit tricky and we're not gonna go through all of the details with this, but I will tell you that all irreducible degree N polynomials are factors of X to the P to the N minus X. And of course that factorization happens over ZP adjoin X. So if you can factor this thing, you just look for the degree N polynomials and those will be your irreducible polynomials and then you can form the quotient and you get a new field. And then what about over Q adjoin X? Well, we're gonna go through the details of that, not how to classify all of them, but some nice like classical tricks.
But before we do that, let's look at two examples. And I think we've looked at these examples before, but this is in a new light. So if we take x squared plus x plus one in z2 adjoin x, you can check that that's irreducible. Since it's a quadratic, all you have to do is show that there are no like zeros of this polynomial, but that makes the corresponding quotient a field. And the standard way of doing computations in this field is to set alpha to be like a root of this polynomial. And if you really want to be like very, very, very careful about this, the alpha is playing the role of x plus the ideal in the quotient space. So that's maybe the really careful way of doing it. But you can also just think of it as a root of that polynomial if you've internalized what's going on in the background. And then we'll have the space z2 adjoin alpha where that's everything of the form a plus b alpha where a and b come from z2. And then alpha, well, it's a root of this polynomial. So in z2, plus and minus one are the same. That means alpha squares to alpha plus one. That gives you a multiplication rule for the elements in this set. And then, well, we're guaranteed for this to be a field because of that result. But you can also check that it's a field directly. And then another classic result that we've seen before is that z squared minus two is irreducible over q adjoin x. That makes the corresponding quotient a field. And in fact, that field is isomorphic to q adjoin root two, which we've worked with before as well. And you can prove that isomorphism pretty easily. Let's take the evaluation homomorphism from q adjoin x to r that takes a polynomial and evaluates it at the square root of two. And then you use the first isomorphism theorem. So I think it's pretty clear here that polynomials in Q adjoin X that will go to zero under this evaluation will be multiples of X squared minus two and thus in the ideal. Okay, so now let's work towards this question of finding irreducible polynomials over Q. Our first little lemma will be to show that if we have a polynomial inside of Q adjoin X, then we can write that polynomial as R over S times a polynomial A0 plus A1X all the way up to ANX to the N, where all of those numbers are integers. Furthermore, this fraction is in lowest terms, which means the GCD of, an, of R and S is one. And then all of these are, well, not pairwise relatively prime, but as a group relatively prime. And the takeaway here is that for any polynomial in Q adjoin X, there is a polynomial with integer coefficients that has the same behavior in terms of the types of zeros and stuff. Okay, so let's get to it. So let's maybe take our polynomial inside of Q adjoin X and write it as follows. So we know that it's gonna be of the form B0 over C0 plus B1 over C1 times X all the way up to BN over CN times X to the N. Those are just like standard ways of writing rational numbers. Now we can factor all of those denominators out and we have one over C0 up to Cn times, well now it's this B0 plus B1x all the way up to Bnx to the n. So like that. And now what we can do is introduce some notation. Let's set D equal to the GCD of B0 up to Bn and then let's write Bi as D times Ai. And that setup means that the GCD of A0 up to AN is equal to one. And that also means we can factor this D out of the, well, whole polynomial and put it in the numerator right here. Okay, so let's do that. So we've got D and then I'll multiply these together to turn them into something I'll call C. And then we're left with A0 plus A1X plus all the way up to a n x to the n. And now the GCD of these coefficients is what we want, it's one, but perhaps the GCD of these two numbers is not one, but that's really easy to fix. We can just reduce this fraction like you would do in elementary school or something. And we'll call that reduction R over S. And if we reduce it all the way, then the GCD of R and S is one. Now we've got a result called Gauss's lemma. 
So we start with a polynomial with integer coefficients. In other words, p of x is in z adjoint x. We also assume it to be monic. That means the leading term is one. Next, let's suppose that p of x factors into alpha and beta, where alpha and beta of x are in q adjoint x. So they're polynomials with rational coefficients. And also let's suppose that this factorization is non-trivial. So in other words, both of their degrees is less than the degree of p of x. So in other words, we've got a monic polynomial in z of x, and we are able to factor it if we use q of x or like polynomials with rational coefficients. Then the important result is this. Then p of x equals a of x times b of x, where a of x and b of x are in z adjoint x, and the degree of a is the degree of alpha, and the degree of b is the degree of beta. So in other words, if something is factorable over q, it's also factorable over z. But that means if it's not factorable over z, then it's not factorable over q, because that's the contrapositive. Of course, we have some, some assumptions here, like it has to be a monic polynomial and things like that. But this is a really strong result that for a huge class of polynomials in rational numbers, if we want to check that it is irreducible, all we have to do is show that it does not factor with integer coefficients. So that really helps us out. Okay, so the first step of this proof is to use the previous result. So that writes alpha x as r1 over s1, and then a0 plus a1x all the way up to a m x to the m, where these are integer coefficients. So I'll call this alpha 1 of x, and recall that that is in z adjoint x. And then we've got beta, and we'll write that the same way. So r2 over s2, and then this polynomial with b type coefficients. I'll call this beta 1 of x, and this is also inside of z adjoint x. Okay, nice. And so now let's notice that from here, we can write p of x as r1 times s1 over r2 times s2 times alpha 1 of x times beta 1 of x. So that's the setup that we have right here. And then let's also introduce a little notation. Let's set r over s to be r1 times r2 over s1 times s2 in lowest terms. So that's gonna be an important part of the calculation as well. And then one last thing that we'll do is rewrite this where everything is inside of the integers. And we can do that like this. We can multiply this s over, so this s is right here, this s1, s2, that was a typo. So we have this is s times p of x is equal to r times alpha one of x times beta one of x. Okay, nice. And now from here, what we'd like to do is expand and look at the leading term. So over here on the left-hand side, the leading term is s times x to what I'll call the degree of p of x. And then that's gonna be plus some lower terms. And we know that because p of x is monic. So its leading term has a coefficient of one, which means the leading term here has a coefficient of s because we're multiplying by s. But what about over here on the right-hand side? Well, we've got r, and then we have am times bn. So this is gonna be r am times bn times x to the m plus n plus lower. But under this setup, we know the degree of p of x, it's simply m plus n. So perhaps that's easier to work with. We'll exchange that right there. Now that leads us to two important cases, and that depends on the value that s takes. And so let's do these as case one and case two. So the first case is that s is equal to one. But notice if s is equal to one, then that means that r times am times bn is also equal to one. But that really means that either they're all one or exactly two of them are negative one, but we can actually simplify the case to all of those being one. So let's see, that means like I said, that r equals am equals a bn equals one. Okay, 
But that means we have our factorization. We have our factorization as p of x equals a of x times b of x, where in this case, a of x is simply alpha 1 of x, and b of x is simply alpha 2 of x. Okay, that's good. And now we're moving on to our second case when s is not equal to 1. Okay. So s is not equal to 1. But let's notice that we do know that r over s is in lowest terms. But that means that the GCD of r with s is equal to 1. OK, well, we've got something that's not 1. Then these GCDs are in lowest terms. That means there must be a prime number that divides s that does not divide r. Because if there wasn't, well, then the GCD would not be equal to 1. OK, so let's take that prime number. So take a prime P such that P divides S, but P does not divide R. And now we're going to use this other GCD requirement that the GCD of all of these coefficients is 1, as well as the GCD of all of those coefficients of 1. That also comes from the lemma. So let's say since GCD of A0 up to AM equals GCD of B0 up to BN is equal to 1, not all of these are multiples of P. Because again, if they were all multiples of P, then the GCD would be a multiple of P. And now here comes the final blow. We're going to take this equation right here and reduce this equation mod P. So in other words, we're going to send it to ZP adjoin X. Now since S is divisible by that prime, S is congruent to 0 mod P. Or in other words, S is 0 in ZP. But that means that we have r times alpha 1 of x times beta 1 of x is equal to 0 in zp adjoin x. But that's actually not possible because not all of these coefficients are divisible by p. And r is also not divisible by p by this kind of construction method for r over here. So we've got a product of non-zero things equals zero. But this is impossible because we know that zp adjoin x is an integral domain. And it being an integral domain means that it has no zero divisors. But we've just had this setup that makes it look like we have zero divisors. So that leads us to a contradiction. And what does that contradict? Well, the validity of this case two being even a possibility in the first place. OK, that finishes this proof. Now we're going to look at an important thing that follows directly from Gauss's lemma, the lemma we just proved. So let's say we've got a monic polynomial with coefficients in the integers. So it's like x to the n plus a n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, all the way down to a sub 0. Let's also assume the constant term is non-zero. Then the result says that if p of x has a 0 which is a rational number, then it in fact has a 0 that is an integer. And moreover, that 0, which I've called alpha over there, must divide the constant term. So this probably seems similar to something that you might have learned in high school called the rational root theorem. And that's actually like an excellent exercise for you to prove on your own based off of these things that we do today. OK, so let's look at this. So let's suppose that p of x has a 0. I'll call that 0 alpha, and that is inside of q. OK, nice. But then from a previous result, that means that we can write p of x as x minus alpha times f of x, where the degree of f of x is equal to n minus 1, as the degree of p of x was equal to n. And now here we want to take the following view. And that is because we know that alpha is a rational number. We don't yet know that it's an integer. And that view is that x minus alpha is inside of q adjoin x. And then f of x is also inside of q adjoin x. Okay. 
But now what we'll do is apply Gauss's lemma. So Gauss says that this in fact factors like P of X equals A of X times B of X with, well, A of X and B of X are polynomials with integer coefficients. So in other words, they're in Z adjoin X and the degree of A of X matches the degree of this, which is one. The degree of B of X matches the degree of F of X. So like I said, we have degree of A of X equals one, degree of B of X equals N minus one. But then since P of X is monic, a of x and b of x are both monic, which means we can expand this equation out into the following. So we have a x to the n plus a n minus one, x to the n minus one, all the way down to a zero equals, well, what does a monic degree one polynomial look like? Well, it's exactly like x minus beta, where beta is an integer now. And then now we've got a degree n minus one monic polynomial. So that'll be x to the n minus one plus all the way down to plus b1x minus b0. But now expanding out this right hand side, we'll see we'll get x to the n plus a bunch of middle terms plus beta times b0. But now comparing the two constant terms, that gives us this equation, a0 equals beta times b0, which tells us that beta divides a0. And I guess I should point this out that I said this in words, but this is all occurring inside of z adjoin x by Gauss's lemma. And that means that beta is an integer. And then this is a bit different than the statement of the corollary up here where alpha was the integer, but we still have the same condition. Our zero had to divide our um, constant term of our original polynomial. Okay, so let's look at an example application of this. Let's look at an example based off of this corollary. So we'll show that the polynomial p of x, which is x to the fourth plus 3x squared minus 2x plus 1, is irreducible over q adjoin x. So let's notice that there are two possible factorizations. There's p of x factoring as a linear polynomial and a cubic polynomial. In that case, there must be a zero that's associated with the linear part of the factorization. Or p of x could be the product of two quadratic polynomials. So let's notice in this first case, when there is a zero, we know that that zero must divide one. That's by this lemma up here. So it has a zero in Z and that zero divides the constant term. Well, in this case, the zero would divide this number one. But that tells us that we only have two possible zeros because there are only two numbers that divide one and that is plus and minus one. Now we can check that those are zeros by plugging them into the original function. So let's look at P of one and if you calculate that out, you'll see that you get three and P of negative one, you get seven. So in neither of those cases do you get zero. So that means that this does not work. So let's maybe put an X there, it does not work. So now let's go to the quadratic times quadratic factorization and this requires a little bit more work but nothing super fancy. So let's notice that P of X is monic which means if it factors, well, It'll first factor over z of x by Gauss's lemma, but also it has to have monic coefficients of each of the factoring terms. So in other words, our terms look like x squared plus ax plus b, and then we have x squared plus cx plus d. But now let's multiply that out and actually expand out both sides of this equation. So we know p of x as given, so we have x to the fourth, plus 3x squared minus 2x plus 1 must be equal to the expansion of this. So that'll be x to the fourth plus a plus c x cubed. And then let's see, our x squared term will be b plus ac plus d. So again, that's just by distributing everything carefully. Our x term will be ad plus bc. 
And then finally, our constant term is BD. And now we're simply going to equate coefficients. And maybe the most important thing to start off noticing is that the equating of the constant terms really help us out. That tells us that b times d equals 1, which splits into two cases. So let's put case 1 here when b and d are both equal to 1. And then likewise, we can put case 2 over here when b and d are both equal to negative 1. Of course, that's the only way that you can multiply integers and get 1. Okay, so if b times d is 1 with the linear term, we'll see that a plus c must be equal to the linear term here, which is negative 2. But at the same time, the cubic term must be equal to the cubic term. The cubic term on the left-hand side is 0, so simultaneously we have a plus c equals 0. But those two things cannot work at the same time, so that means we actually have no solution in this first case. Which is expected because our goal is to show that this is irreducible, which means there should be no solution. Okay, so now let's move to the next case when b and d are negative 1. So let's take this equation again, this one from the cubic terms, which gives us a plus c equals 0 because there's no cubic term over here. And then plugging b equals d equals 1 here, we'll see that we get negative a minus c equals negative 2, which reduces to a plus c equals 2. But either way you look at that, that's impossible because you have the same quantity equaling 2 and 0. Zero. So we've got no solution over here either. But those were the only two ways to get a factorization here. Neither of them worked, which means there's also no quadratic quadratic factorization, which means that this is irreducible. So our next big theorem is called Eisenstein's criterion, and it's a nice test to see if something is an irreducible polynomial over Q. So let's suppose we've got a prime P. And then we have a polynomial f of x, that's a sub n x to the n, a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1, all the way down a1x plus a0. And then let's suppose that the prime p divides ai for i between 0 and n minus 1. So it divides all of these coefficients up to the leading term. But we'll assume that it does not divide the leading term. And also, its square does not divide the constant term. So in this special setup, f of x is irreducible over q. So that's quite a setup, but it does give you irreducibility of a polynomial. Okay, so let's get to it. So let's suppose that we can factor f of x and in this setup. So in other words, f of x satisfies all of these things, but yet we can still factor it, and we want to end up with some sort of problem there. Okay, so let's write it as b sub r x to the r plus all the way down to b0, and then we'll have c sub s x to the s all the way down to c0. And now let's expand this a little bit just to get a feel for what's going on here. And the expansion, or I guess I should say the partial expansion looks like this. So we have br cs x to the r plus s plus a bunch of terms in the middle plus b0 c0 must be equal to, let's see, a n x to the n plus a bunch of middle terms plus a0 like that. And so now immediately we know that brcs must be equal to a n just by comparing coefficients and b0 c0 must be equal to a0 again by comparing coefficients. So now we want to use this divisibility by p. Okay, so since p divides a0, that tells us that p divides b0 times c0. So it divides the product. But if something divides a product, or I really should say if a prime divides a product, it must divide one of the terms. So in other words, we have p divides b0 or p divides c0. And now, in a general setup, you could have the possibility of 
P dividing both, but in fact, that's not possible here because if P divided both, then P squared would divide A zero, but we've assumed that that does not happen. So let's include that here. So, but not both, and like I said, that is because P squared does not divide A zero. Okay, so now let's assume one of these to be divisible by P, but not the other. So maybe without loss of generality, let's assume that this is occurring so that P divides B zero, but this is not occurring. So in other words, P does not divide C zero. Okay, so that's the setup that we get from P dividing A naught, but P squared not dividing A naught. And now let's look at the condition of P not dividing A n. So since P does not divide A n, that tells us that P does not divide B r times C s, but that tells us that P does not divide B r and P does not divide C s. Because if it divided one of them, then it would divide their product and we would be out of there. So it can't divide either. Okay, but now what does that tell us? That tells us that the following set is non-empty. And that set will be made up of all of the coefficients bk such that k is between, let's see, 0 and r and p does not divide b sub k. So in other words, what we do is we look at all of the coefficients of this polynomial in the factorization, and we pick out the coefficients that are not divisible by, oh, and like I said, the really important thing is that this is non-empty. So let's maybe put that over here. This is non-empty. But since this is non-empty, what we can do is take an M to be minimal among these K between zero and R. So what that means is that B sub M is not divisible by P. So B sub M is not divisible by P, like I said, but everything before it is. So let's write that down. So, but P divides um, B zero as like our assumption goes right there. P divides B1 all the way up to P divides BM minus one. Okay, so the ability to take this M is fueled by the fact that this is non-zero or non-empty. We know it's non-empty because, well, at least B sub R is in there. Okay, so now let's look at the coefficient A sub M. So let's, like I say, look at the coefficient a sub m, which by the general rule for multiplication of polynomials looks like this. So this is b0 cm plus b1 cm minus one, all the way up to bm minus one c1 plus bm c0. But by the way that we chose M, we know that B0, B1 up to BM minus one are all divisible by P. So let's write that, divisible by P. But by the way that we chose M, well B sub M is not divisible by P and then C sub zero was also not divisible by P. So this is not divisible by P. But look at that, we've got something that's a sub m, which let's just recall, we assumed this was divisible by p, or maybe is divisible by p. That's like built into the assumption of our setup up here. Okay, so now let's look at this. We have two terms that are divisible by p, and one term that is not divisible by p, but that's a contradiction. You could think of it like this. So you could subtract everything in this first chunk over to the left and the left hand side would be divisible by P or in other words, a multiple of P, but the right hand side would not. And that's a contradiction. So that leads us to, like I said, a contradiction. And now we always have to think about, well, what did we really contradict? Well, we contradicted our ability to do this factorization in the first place. So that means it must be impossible to do the factorization and thus f of x is irreducible.
Okay, let's look at an example. Okay, so for our example, let's consider the seventh degree polynomial f of x, which is 5x to the 7 plus 4x to the 6 plus 2x to the 5th minus 10x cubed plus 12x squared plus 8x plus 14. So let's notice that we can take p equal to 2 and use Eisenstein's criteria here. So notice that 2 does not divide 5, whereas 2 does divide 4, 2 does divide 2, 2 does divide negative 10, 2 does divide 12, 2 does divide 8, and finally 2 divides 14, but 4 does not divide 14. So that's the exact setup we need for Eisenstein's criterion to tell us that yes, f of x is irreducible over q adjoin x. But then maybe the cool takeaway here is that we've got q adjoin x mod the polynomial generated by f of x is indeed a field. This is a pretty crazy field because maybe it's multiplication of those extra terms outside of q is fueled by this polynomial. So motivated by this type of example, you can also construct other new fields out of irreducible polynomials over q. Now let's look at an example inside of a finite field. Okay, so let's say we wanna find degree three irreducible polynomials over z2 adjoint x. So by that fact I mentioned earlier in the video that we're not gonna prove, all we have to do is factor x to the two to the three minus x. That's our prime here is two, and then our n here from that previous like language is three. So I think maybe the best bet for factorization here is simply trial and error, but maybe we would start with something like that. And then after that, we could write this as x times x minus 1 times x to the 6 plus x to the 5th plus x to the 4th plus x cubed plus x squared plus x plus 1. And in fact, all of that factorization can occur just over the integers or over the rational numbers. We haven't used the fact that we're going to work over z2 adjoint x. But now we will, and that'll be to factor this 6 degree polynomial. And if you factor that, you get the following object. So x times x minus 1, and then x cubed plus x squared plus 1, times x cubed plus x plus 1. So that means that these two are irreducibles as they are factors of this object right here. Okay, so that means that if we set i equal to the principal ideal, for example, generated by this one, x cubed plus x plus 1, then z2 adjoin x mod i is a field. And now let's like introduce some notation, and this is notation that I hinted at before. Let's write elements of this quotient in the following form. So instead of writing like ax squared plus bx plus c plus i, let's instead write a times alpha squared plus b times alpha plus c, where alpha cubed is equal to alpha plus one, which notice that's equivalent to saying alpha cubed plus alpha plus one is equal to zero. In other words, alpha is like some sort of root that we have built of this polynomial. Of course, like really it's just playing the role of being inside of this coset. So that allows us to think that this z2 adjoin alpha is really this z2 adjoin x mod i. So that's how we're thinking about this. And again, we know that's a field from the result that we proved at the beginning of the video. Now furthermore, we can list the elements of this fairly easily. We have 0, 1, alpha, alpha plus 1, alpha squared, alpha squared plus 1, alpha squared plus alpha. Let's see, how many do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So one more would be alpha. So one more would be alpha squared plus alpha plus 1. So there we have eight total elements. How do we know we need eight elements? 
Well, every element is of this form, and we've got two choices for A, two for B, and two for C. Two times two times two is eight. Why do we not need alpha cubed and higher? It's because alpha cubed is equal to alpha plus one, and then after that we can just like decrease the exponent. And now let's notice like we could do some sample calculations, and the ones that I've come up with are inverse pairs. So let's look at alpha times alpha squared plus one. So that would be like this element times this element. So that's gonna be equal to alpha cubed plus alpha, but alpha cubed is alpha plus one, so that gives us alpha plus one plus alpha, but then that gives us two alpha plus one, but two alpha is equal to zero because we're inside of Z2, those coefficients are inside of Z2, so two is equal to zero. So that gives us one. That means that alpha and alpha squared plus one are inverse pairs. Now, of course, we could do another one. We could do like alpha squared times alpha squared plus alpha plus one. That's gonna give us alpha to the fourth plus alpha cubed plus alpha squared. And then we could simplify that a little bit at a time. So notice that this alpha to the fourth is the same thing as alpha cubed times alpha, but alpha cubed is this, so that's simply alpha times alpha plus one. Again, that's the same thing as alpha times alpha cubed. And then that alpha cubed is again alpha plus one, and then we have plus alpha squared. But now notice if you were to multiply that all out, you'd get two alpha squared, which is zero, you'd get two alpha, which is zero, and then you'd get plus one. So that means in the end you would have one, so you've got another example of inverse pairs. Then you could also do some other sample calculations. So this is the general strategy for constructing a field, and in fact, this is a field of order eight, or of order two cubed. So maybe let's pick this or put this in here generally right here for a field of order p to the n, all we need to do is take zp adjoin x and mod out by an n degree irreducible polynomial. And now, those of you who have seen this stuff before may know that there is only one field of order p to the n, so you get a unique one, but we'll not prove that. This is just the general strategy of first getting or getting your first field of order p to the n. And so, of course, finding that n degree irreducible polynomial might be a bit tricky, but at least we have a way of getting at it. Okay, let's leave us with some warm ups. So, here are some nice warm ups based off what we saw. The first is to find out if the following polynomials are irreducible over q adjoin x. So we've got a couple of tests for that. Next, let's find all degree four irreducible polynomials over z2 adjoin x. And then finally, let's construct a field of order 27, and then also find a couple of inverse pairs within that field. So by an inverse pair, I mean two elements whose product is one, the multiplicative identity. And that's a good place to stop.